Hello, I'm Dustin Moss. I'm a researcher in the Flux Group at the University of Utah working on Powder, which is an open platform for experimental wireless research that offers users remote access to a variety of compute, networking, and RF resources. Today I'm going to demonstrate how you can experiment with LTE or 5G handover on Powder. You can find more information about Powder and the open source software we'll be using in the video description. For this demonstration, we'll be making use of some compute and networking resources, along with a few software-defined radios which exist in our RF attenuator matrix. SDRs in the matrix are connected to each other via coaxial cables and dynamically configurable attenuators, which makes the matrix perfect for experimenting with handover. We'll be using two open-source LTE or 5G stacks for this demonstration. SRS RAN will provide the RAN elements, while Open5GS will provide the core network. To get started, we'll start an experiment in Powder. And switch to the SRS RAN handover profile. If we click Show Profile, we can see a description of the profile and detailed instructions about how to use it. But we're going to be stepping through these instructions after we instantiate our experiment, so I'll do that now. This will bring us to the parameterization step. This profile doesn't have many parameters, just the type of compute node we'd like to use for the core network and some advanced parameters that allow for selecting different resources in the attenuator matrix. Next, we'll arrive at the finalized step where we provide a name for our experiment and select which project we'd like to use. Finally, we arrive at the schedule step. Here we can schedule our experiment for later or select a previously made reservation, which will auto-populate the start and end dates and times. We'll use the defaults in this case, which will start the experiment immediately and set the end time to 16 hours from now. It will be a few minutes before our experiment becomes ready, and after that we'll have to wait for some startup scripts to finish installing and configuring SRS RAN and Open5GS. The list view of our experiment will indicate when they are finished. While we're waiting, let's take a look at the topology of our experiment. You can see that we have four nodes in total. The nodes labeled ENB1, ENB2, and UE are all NUC compute nodes with B210SDRs attached. The B210s are wired into the attenuator matrix, and the links between the UE and the two E node Bs are paths in that matrix. These nodes will serve as our RAN elements in this demonstration. The node labeled CN is a D740 compute node, in which the profile is configured to have a LAN link to each E node B. This node will serve as the core network node in our experiment, and the links between it and the enode Bs will support the S1 interfaces. Okay, looking back at the list view, we can see that the startup scripts have finished. Now we'll step through the instructions in the profile. But as an overview, the UE will start out camped on enode B1, with the matrix path corresponding to the downlink between enode B1 and the UE being unattenuated. Enode B2 will be running at the same time, but will attenuate its downlink to the UE to simulate the UE being out of range. Then we'll introduce some attenuation for the enode B1 downlink, simulating the UE moving further from enode B1. And finally, we'll incrementally reduce the attenuation for the enode B2 downlink, simulating the UE moving closer to enode B2. At some point, the UE will start reporting better downlink signal for enode B2 than for enode B1, and eventually a handover from enode B1 to enode B2 will be triggered. With that in mind, let's log into each of the nodes in our experiment. The Open5GS core network should already be configured and running, so let's tail the log of the MME, and that way we'll be able to verify that our enode Bs are able to connect. Next, we'll start up the enode Bs. Okay, we can see that the enode Bs have established S1 connections to our core network. Before we start our UE, we'll attenuate the enode B2 downlink and make sure that the enode B1 downlink is unattenuated. 
In order to do this, we'll use a command line tool provided by the profile to identify and adjust the attenuators in our experiment. This tool can be used on any node in our experiment, but we'll run it from the CN node. We'll use the L flag to produce a list of node pairs and corresponding attenuator IDs. Here's the output for our experiment. In this case, NUC1, NUC2, and NUC4 are the nodes corresponding to the UE, enode B1, and enode B2, respectively. In the row containing NUC1 and NUC4, the first attenuator ID, 4, represents the path from the first node, NUC1, or the UE, to the second, NUC4, or enode B2, while the second ID, 35, represents the path from the second node, NUC4, or enode B2, to the first, NUC1, or the UE. So we'll set attenuator ID 35 to 40 to start in order to simulate the UE being significantly further away from enode B2 than enode B1. We'll also make sure that the enode B1 downlink is unattenuated by setting ID 33 to 0. Okay, now let's start up our UE. We can see it quickly sync with enode B1. If we input T into standard in on the UE, it will start to print some cell metrics to standard out. The physical cell identifier and reference signal receive power columns in the signal section will be of interest. They're represented by PCI and RSRP, respectively. PCI indicates which cell the UE is currently attached to. This profile configures enode B1 and enode B2 to have PCIs 1 and 2, respectively. RSRP represents the average power of resource elements containing reference signals on the downlink. The UE reports RSRP values for the current and neighboring cells back to the current cell, which decides if and when a handover should occur. We'll start a ping process pointed at the core network in another session on the UE node. This will keep the UE from going idle while we're adjusting gains and allow us to verify that the packet data connection remains intact across handover events. Next, we'll add some attenuation to the downlink for enode B1. We can immediately see changes in the metrics reported by the UE. The RSRP measurements for the current cell have dropped by around 10 dB, and it may intermittently report some measurements for the neighboring cell with PCI2, which is enode B2. We'll add another 10 dB of attenuation to the enode B1 downlink. We'll see that the RSRP for that cell decreases again, and now the UE is consistently reporting RSRP measurements for enode B2, the neighboring cell. Now we'll decrease the attenuation for the enode B2 downlink in increments of 10 dB until we have similar RSRP measurements for both the current and neighboring cell. At this point, another 10 dB reduction in attenuation for the enode B2 downlink should trigger a handover. There we saw the enode B indicate that it was starting an S1 handover, and the UE indicated that it received the handover command, and then it attached to enode B2. Our ping process saw a momentary increase in latency, but the connection remained intact. Now the UE metrics show that the current cell is PCI2, or enode B2, and PCI1, or enode B1, is seen as the neighboring cell. We can reverse the handover real quick by once again increasing the attenuation for the enode B2 downlink. All right, another handover was triggered, and now the UE is again attached to enode B1. That's the end of this S1 handover demonstration on powder. Thank you for watching, and special thanks to the National Science Foundation and the developers of SRS RAN and Open5GS.